Hi everyone, this is Eastern European. Thank you for watching my channel and my videos. Today is a day that we will be exploring the third part of the documentary UFOs Do Not Exist, the grand deception and cover-up of the UFO phenomenon. Mr. Bill Nell, the great researcher who organized that documentary, will give you his perspective of what's going on around the globe and why government wants to work together with aliens. But let's not spoil this story. See and hear for yourself. As always, Eastern European will bring you very interesting topics. Topics about mysteries, secrets, government cover-ups, conspiracy theories, UFOs, aliens, and many, many more. Remember, soon you will be traveling into the unknown. Astronomers peering through their telescopes often saw strange objects coming and going from the moon, as this 1880s photograph illustrates. Astronaut John Glenn saw and photographed strange objects in space during his historic 1962 Mercury space flight. As soon as humans arrived in space, they found that they were not alone. During the moon flights, astronauts found it hard to mask descriptions of what they saw when it came to UFOs. Some made statements using old pilot slang for UFOs referring to them as things like Santa Claus. Wally Shira was the first to use the Santa term to describe a UFO during a Mercury 8 flight. Astronauts often reported seeing strange lights on the dark side of the moon. During a 1968 moon mission, astronaut James Lovell said, Please be informed that there is a Santa Claus, after seeing something odd on the dark side. Neil Armstrong, the first man to set foot on the moon, was photographed with a large bright object hovering over his head. In 1992, a French astronomer saw and photographed odd lights inside the huge moon crater Langrenus. Such lights have been seen by astronomers for over a hundred years and remain unexplained. Scientists refer to them as transient lunar phenomena. Is this strange object filmed from an Apollo spacecraft near the moon, a possible source for the odd lights? More than a few moonwalkers reported a feeling that they were always being watched. The truth may be out there, but if it's on the moon, NASA probably airbrushed it out. The upside of modern technology is the ability for us to go back and look at what amounts to some creative artwork on moon photos that have been touched up by NASA. Here we see an Apollo astronaut standing in front of a totally black background. Where are the stars? When a computer reads through the changes made to the photo, we see what appears to be the ruins of a dome. In 1967, the unmanned Surveyor 6 took this photo of what appears to be a dome 
covering the sinus medi area of the moon. These domes illustrate that someone visited and possibly occupied the moon long before we ever walked on it. NASA may have covered up this information to avoid allowing other nations the opportunity to gain access to whatever discoveries they made. The Space Shuttle Program has also had its share of odd happenings involving UFOs. On March 24, 1989, veteran Space Shuttle astronaut John Blaha paused during a conversation, then told Houston that we still have the alien spacecraft under observation. That mission landed at night and under a veil of secrecy. Blaha has not commented on the event. No photo taken by NASA has evoked more controversy than this one. It shows what seems to be a perfectly formed face on the planet Mars, with several pyramids nearby in a neat circle. The so-called face on Mars opened the door to expose many lies that NASA has told about the red planet. NASA told the public that Mars was a dead, waterless world with an atmosphere too thin to support life. A thin atmosphere? They sent probes that used parachutes, allowing the machines to float to the ground. No water? NASA has done a complete reversal on this and now believes there to be a substantial amount of frozen water under the surface. A dead world? Several probes sent to Mars have mysteriously malfunctioned, and as with the moon, strange lights are often seen on the surface. Is this Manhattan on Mars? This photo appears to show the remains of a large city that once sat on an island surrounded by water. Like many other parts of Mars, this area shows artificial manipulation of the landscape that geologists cannot easily explain. The study of UFOs can sometimes be a very dangerous business. Former naval officer Bill Cooper delivered an expose about the government cover-up of UFOs in 1989 entitled The Secret Government. For the next 10 years, Cooper spoke out against government secrecy. In March of 1999, Bill Cooper sent his family out of the United States for their security. He lived and worked alone with his two dogs, one rooster, and one chicken. Having run afoul of the government, he found himself charged with various crimes. When police came to serve warrants on him, they claimed that he ran from them, jumped in his car, drove around patrol vehicles, went in his home and started firing shots at them. A pretty athletic feat for a guy with just one leg. They shot and killed him. For several years, Bill Schneider spoke to anyone who would listen about his involvement with the construction of secret underground bases allegedly used by the United States government to deal with aliens. Schneider accused the government of selling out to alien influences. One of the places where the government is said to have built underground facilities is near Dulce, New Mexico. These underground bases are allegedly shared between humans and aliens and seem to serve their interests more than ours. Some believe the government allows the aliens to abduct people for the purposes of experimentation and study in return for technology. But at this time, these theories are mere speculation. It's interesting to note that a number of unexplained cattle mutilations have occurred in the Dulce area. 
Such mutilations take place worldwide and are often associated with UFO sightings. During his travels, Bill Schneider was shot on numerous occasions. In 1996, he was found dead in his home, having been tortured and killed. Tubing was wrapped around his neck. Despite this, his death was ruled a suicide. Bill's father worked as a ship's doctor on the USS Eldridge, famous for being involved with the Philadelphia experiment. There are many different interpretations and views of what really happened or didn't when the U.S. Navy embarked on a project to demagnetize warships beginning in 1943. The information that I'm about to provide represents my best guess based on 30 years of research into an experiment that began 60 years ago and my own encounters with those who claim intimate knowledge about the project. I grew up in the 1960s and first became aware of the Philadelphia experiment when I was just 10 years old. I read a number of non-fiction books about UFOs. The two subjects became linked when Morris K. Jessup wrote a book entitled The Case for the UFO in 1955. After the book was published, a mysterious man who called himself Carlos Miguel Allende wrote to Jessup in the first of a series of rambling correspondences. The letters seemed to indicate that Jessup's call for open discussion and government disclosure of any knowledge about UFOs was a waste of time. According to Allende, there were other forces at work which sought to protect various secrets regarding how UFOs were powered and did the things they did. Although Jessup was not impressed with Allende's letters, he was more than a little surprised after being contacted by three naval officers who worked for the Office of Naval Research, the ONR. Although they claimed that the contact was not official and made on their own initiative, the officers seemed disturbed by an annotated copy of Jessup's book that the ONR had received. The book had notes scribbled in it by what appeared to be three different people, but most now agree it was all the work of Allende. Again, the references seemed to indicate that the government had accidentally discovered how UFOs are able to manipulate time and space through a Navy project designed to make ships invisible. After contact with the Navy, Jessup was certain that he had stumbled onto something and thrust all his efforts into finding out what it was. By 1959, Jessup had assembled an impressive portfolio of research into what the U.S. military knew and was hiding from the public about UFOs and the secret Navy experiment. Set to testify about these matters before a Florida senator and several interested parties, Jessup set off to drive from his home in Florida to Washington, D.C. in 1959, but he never made it. Morris K. Jessup was found dead in his car just off of a highway in Dade County, Florida. He had died from exposure to carbon monoxide. Although his death was ruled a suicide, none of his papers or the extensive research he had recently completed was ever located. I read about some of this in a book published in the 1960s by Jessup's friend and colleague, Ivan T. Sanderson. Sanderson wasn't just another author. He was a scientist who believed in the possibility of alien visitations to Earth based on the available evidence. Shortly before Morris Jessup's death, Jessup gave Sanderson a copy of The Case for the UFO, which contained his notes 
about annotations made by, made by Allende. My own interest in the Navy project might have been satisfied at that point, but for a chance meeting with a former sailor who had been at the Philadelphia Navy shipyard during World War II. In 1973, I visited the family of my best friend's bride-to-be in Florida. We all got together to discuss and further plan for the upcoming wedding. Amy's father was a retired sailor named Joseph. He was a polite but serious individual. During a lighter moment in conversation, I happened to mention the Navy project that I read about and its supposed connection to flying saucers. There had been a number of UFO sightings in Florida during that time, and the topic was on everyone's lips. After dinner, Amy's father sat down across from me while the others muddled through some wedding plans and became very serious. He told me that in 1944 he'd met another sailor who seemed deeply disturbed about the outcome of a strange experiment connected to the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard in 1943. The man claimed that his best friend died during the experiment. Joseph and his new acquaintance shared many conversations about it after becoming friends. The man said that after making some casual inquiries, a doctor at the shipyard hospital confided to him that his friend had died as a result of melting into the ship's superstructure. The physician claimed that the man was still alive when they tried to free him from part of the deck, but he had been fused with it. I encouraged Joseph to write down everything he could remember about his conversations with the sailor. He agreed and actually took things a step further. He attempted to contact the man who he'd befriended so many years before, but hadn't heard from in some time. A mutual friend told him that the sailor had passed away, but provided a contact phone number for his widow. When Joseph called, the woman accepted his condolences, and the two had a brief conversation. It seems that after the sailor retired in the 1960s, he tried contacting others who had been a part of the Navy project to get more information on the death of his friend. But the sailor died a few months later in a hit-and-run accident. This made Joseph think twice about his own investigation, of the matter, which ended abruptly after that call. From then on, I began to seriously research the Philadelphia experiment. By the 1980s, a book on the subject had been published by William Moore and Charles Berlitz entitled The Philadelphia Experiment, Project Invisibility. The book was the short version of some truth, various theories, and some wild notions by Berlitz. Moore was forced to endure some of the nonsense included in the book by Berlitz in order to get it published. While Moore was new to the publishing world, Charles Berlitz had already written a successful, if not equally vague, book on the Bermuda Triangle. While the Moore and Berlitz book brought attention to the subject and satisfied those already mildly interested in the subject matter, most of the attention came in the form of scorn and skeptical criticism. Critics pointed to what they felt were a number of glaring errors and historical inaccuracies. Things got worse when a major Hollywood film based on the book was released in 1984. Instead of becoming a documentary-style piece, it was a fictionalized account of the Navy project that turned out to be a sci-fi love story mixed with ridiculous twists and turns. I doubt that anyone except those with direct involvement know the truth and entire story of the Philadelphia experiment. But here is my take on what happened. Several young scientists at Princeton University in New Jersey had been working on various physics projects involving time travel, time displacement, 
and using strong energy fields to move and manipulate objects from a purely theoretical standpoint. This was all done on paper, and nothing could be proved. As World War II began, most knew that the U.S. was secretly trying to develop an atomic weapon that would end the war quickly. Many of the scientists, like Einstein, knew that this was something that was necessary because they felt the Germans might have been doing it also. But they also knew that a weapon like this was not something that could be put back in the box after the war was won. The Navy had their own doubts about the atomic weapon. They were certain that nothing short of a full-scale naval assault on the home islands of Japan would end the war. In the meantime, they faced another problem. The Navy was losing ships to German U-boat attacks and a new type of mine that the Nazis were using, which could attach itself to the hulls of ships by being attracted to them because of their magnetized hulls. They needed to find a way to quickly demagnetize their ships and make them invisible to U-boats and other attack ships and planes. The Navy traditionally degaus ships in port, but this was a time-consuming method of demagnetizing that was impractical during wartime. They also tried using various exotic paint mixtures designed to refract or redirect light away from their ships but this still left them visible and vulnerable to air forces, radar, and submarine attack. When the Navy came calling at Princeton, a few young physicists saw an opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. They would solve the Navy's little problem, and at the same time test some of their own theories regarding time displacement and using strong energy fields to manipulate matter in a real-world setting. Although his work during World War II remains classified to this day, Albert Einstein was under contract to the Navy during that time. What I've been able to glean from many sources is that Einstein, even though he had once asked Franklin Roosevelt to begin development of an atomic bomb, still preferred the development of defensive weapons, knowing that the atom bomb was something that could ultimately lead to the complete destruction of the human race. Those who agreed with the defensive weapons idea at Princeton were invited to join his efforts. This group of scientists told the Navy that they could make a ship invisible to radar, sonar, and would work on ways to effectively hide it from view. Of course, what they didn't explain was the actual nature of the technology they were planning on using to accomplish these goals. Because it was so close to Princeton, secure, and had ships available for experimentation, the Philadelphia Navy shipyard was chosen as the physical home of the project. A new and not yet commissioned ship, which would eventually be called the USS Eldridge, was chosen as a test craft for the project. Jane's military, noted for its accuracy, lists the Eldridge as having been launched in June of 1943. The official Navy records list it as having been launched in July of 1943. This easily leaves the window open for the ship to have been used for the initial experiments. The first part of the experimentation took place at the shipyard in 1943 when a powerful energy field was used to instantly degauss the ship without any damage to electronic equipment on board. The vessel also became invisible to radar, but an unexpected and more than welcomed side effect occurred that scientists had hoped for, but the Navy didn't expect. The ship briefly vanished from sight, becoming what the observers had thought was invisible. In reality, the ship had briefly moved to another time and place, having returned when the off-ship field generating equipment was shut down. Some small animals placed on board in cages 
died after a strange green, greenish glow encircled the hull just before and after the ship vanished. No humans were on board during that particular test that we know about, and the details of the animal deaths were ignored by naval officials overseeing the project after being told that the fields in use could be adjusted for safety. The experiment moved forward full speed. By 1944, a sea trial was ordered. The Eldridge was manned and surrounded by several other ships. All carried the same technology with the hope that convoys of radar and sonar invisible ships would pass German U-boats and other enemy craft undetected. But the Eldridge was the only vessel given permission to power up to full field strength on that particular occasion. With many observers, including a merchant marine, later known as Carlos Miguel Allende, aboard the USS Furiasat, the experiment commenced off the east coast of the United States, somewhere between Long Island and New Jersey. While everyone watched, the Eldridge powered up its field generation equipment. As before, a strange green glow appeared and the ship began to fade from sight. On board, things started to go badly. Sailors became disoriented, couldn't see, and some were burnt by the green mist. Others faded into the wooden deck and steel superstructure of the ship. Moments after it vanished in 1944, the Eldridge briefly appeared in 1983 off of the coast of Long Island. That occurred because the ship had been pulled through a sort of time displacement wormhole simultaneously created by the 1944 experiment and another one taking place as a follow-up project at a government base thought to be abandoned near Montauk Point in 1983. When the Montauk base shut down their power in 83, the ship was pulled back through the vortex to 1944 and reappeared seconds after. Upon its return, strange objects were seen above the ship. These may have been UFOs. It's possible and even likely that humans had just discovered how aliens were able to warp and manipulate time and space fields to move about as they liked. But in 1944, humans lacked the technology or computers to control such powerful energy fields. The result was that a third of the crew died, having become a part of the ship's wooden deck and steel superstructure. Many parts of the ship were covered with canvas to conceal the dead before it was allowed to return to the Philadelphia Navy shipyard that night. Those who survived the 1944 sea trial sometimes faded back and forth between time periods. An article in a 1944 edition of the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper stated that during a bar fight at a local dive where sailors and workers from the Navy Yard drank, two sailors briefly became translucent and even transparent, fading into the rear wall of the bar. Others went insane. By 1945, the Navy had all the remaining sailors from the second part of the Philadelphia Explosion Experiment, Sea Trials, locked up in the shipyard hospital's mental ward. What became of them after that, I don't know. While naysayers point out that members of the commissioned Eldridge's crew say none of this ever happened on their watch, most of what happened did so before the ship was commissioned, or possibly during times when a special crew was placed on board for the project. Besides that, the Eldridge was a cookie-cutter ship. There were thousands of ships like it made, and it's likely that one of them could have also been used as part of the experiment. Since we don't have... 
Although disappointed at some of the results of the sea trials, the Navy realized that it had a new and exciting technology, and they weren't about to let it go. Not only had the project shown them that the use of controlled energy fields could produce the ability to move objects and people rapidly through time and space, but the fields produced an effect on the human mind. After some of the sailors from the 1944 sea trials went insane, the Navy wondered if that effect could be controlled and directed at friendly forces to make them fight fearlessly or at enemy forces to make them surrender. All these theories would later be tested at what had once been the home of World War II shore batteries and later a radar facility used to protect coastal areas of North America from incoming bombers or missiles during part of the Cold War. Willing and unwilling participants were apparently brought to the government facility, once known as Camp Hero near Montauk Point, to test the new technology. Because these tests attracted UFOs, it was no accident that thousands of sightings occurred during the time period when the tests were accomplished. This led some UFO researchers to erroneously conclude that Long Island hosted some sort of base for UFOs, possibly somewhere offshore. Rudder, a popular boating magazine in the 1960s, ran a 1969 article warning boaters that a number of pleasure craft had encountered UFOs off of the Long Island coast near Montauk Point and were unable to restart their engines after these objects moved. Regarding Einstein's possible involvement, he was never actually seen at the shipyard that we know about, but it's possible that his position was with the project was more a ceremonial one allowing the Navy to make use of whatever ideas he cared to input, while other physicists and engineers were given carte blanche on the scene to do whatever was necessary to get the job done. Most of them were young, ambitious, and eager to test their theories in the real world. Today, we may be seeing some of the fruits of the Philadelphia experiment in the form of a growing fleet of advanced ships with stealth capabilities, classified weapon systems, and secret technology. Even a stealth sub is in the works. But was the technology applicable to more than just seagoing vessels? By the time 1966 rolled around, a series of top secret experiments had been underway for at least 10 years on creating a fleet of truly invisible military aircraft. Faced with the daily embarrassment of advanced aircraft being shot down in Vietnam, President Lyndon Johnson's Secretary of Defense, Robert S. McNamara, made a desperate decision. He decided to test a new technology to make large military aircraft invisible. Imagine the advantage of having large military bombers and transport aircraft available to you that were completely invisible.